Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. Delighted on this episode to be talking with author, artist, creator, Prentice Rollins. May I call you Prentice? Is that all yes. right? Yes, Jason, that's fine. Great, great. Uh, thanks for spending some time. We've spent a little bit of time just chatting before I hit record, but thanks for spending some time talking with me and uh, like talking you. about the world of graphic novels and, and comics and all things literary and visual and <laughs> artistic and all of those things. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so I'll mention at the top of the episode a couple of your works that have resonated with me most and then, then we'll also we'll explore uh the things that have resonated with you and that, that you'd like to talk about as well and one of those being the furnace um i really appreciate that book both because you're doing a lot um you're you're the auteur on that book um <laughs> and i also love that genre the the dystopian uh storyline the you know sort of like logan's run meets wh whatever book or title you'd want to throw in from there vonnegut or, or whatever it happens to be yeah um <clears throat> that that was a, a passion project um it started as a prose story i was with taking a uh, gotham writers workshop in new york city in uh 2000 and i remember there were a lot of news stories uh at the time about supermax prisons and and prisoners being held in solitary confinement and um and it was just on my mind because it was kind of in the air mm -hmm. and um so i needed to write a, a short story for this for this class this workshop and so i just i wrote a, a science fiction short story um and it was about a um an aging physicist lamenting his youthful involvement with um, what was called the guard program. It was um, this scheme to release supermax prisoners, violent, dangerous criminals back into society. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, the catch being that they would be assigned a drone that would follow them around and render them invisible and incapable of interacting with people. Um, and so that's what happens. And then there's this uh, human tragedy which ensues, namely the, the guards cannot be deactivated for some reason and all the prisoners in their charge uh, begin to die off for reasons unknown. And it's, you know, it's left to the reader's imagination why they're all dying, whether it's uh, they're some means of suicide or who knows. In any case, um, the, the story was well received in the uh, workshop and uh, about it was about 2005 i decided to, i wanted to give it a graphic novel treatment mm -hmm. um in the meantime i had lost the short story i i for some reason didn't have it on my computer and i had lost my hard copy so i had mm -hmm. to reconstruct it from memory in the form of a graphic novel script which was easy enough um but i fleshed it out a lot i added uh, a lot of elements and characters and um got it to the point where it's about uh, close to 200 pages and then I did a second draft and a third and then I started uh, doing the art um, in any case I worked on the art for um, the better part of seven years but it was off and on it was a wow, back burner wow. project yeah I set it aside for a couple of times for a period of about a year each and um, just whenever I had you know a paying job of some sort I had to set it aside but I kept returning to it in any case, um, yeah, it was um, published by Tor Books in 2018, and I was delighted with the um, with the results and, and delighted mm -hmm. that it found such a great home. Um, <clears throat> and I'm I'm also um, you know pretty pleased with it. Um, yeah, just yeah. in terms of the, it, I mean, it's a funny thing. It was originally you know when I was when I was doing the art, it was um, I I was seeing it in black and white. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was the artwork is pretty dense and intricate and detailed and textured. Um, but the publisher told me they wanted it in color. So I had to spend six very happy months um, scanning and coloring the pages with Photoshop. It was a very fun thing to do because I knew the book had a home. Yeah. And, and, and everybody seemed convinced that it would make it better. And I think it did. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that was that was my first my first, um, you know, uh, I guess it was sort of my technically my debut graphic novel. Um, I had done in 2005 or six a book for Watson Guptill Publishing called 
um, and sadly, I don't have a copy handy. It's called The Making of a Graphic Novel. And it's a it's, it's an art instruction book, but it contains a self-contained 100 page science fiction graphic novel called The Resonator, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which um, funnily enough is the it's really the only thing I've ever gotten, you know, fan emails for <laughs> every oh, nice. year. Every year I'll get one or two emails saying I really love the resonator. Uh, <laughs> never gotten any for the furnace, not yet at least, but uh <laughs> you, you can consider this a fan email. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that is funny. It's funny what people respond to and uh I mean tour is is a great home for a passion project. That's yeah. uh fantastic. <laughs> and I have to ask being focused on uh, a super max setting and and the sort of ideas that you're playing with you said you're a phil philosophy you were a philosophy major is that I, right yes in, in college um i i did not study art i i majored in philosophy and history and then i was intent for a while there on a career in academia so oh, i got wow. into a phd program at rutgers university um and uh, I left after two years with a master's because I had decided that I wanted to pursue my passion for comics. Um, mm -hmm. I started drawing comics when I was 11 years old, which is when Star Wars came out. It wasn't Star Wars episode four, it was just a movie called Star Wars. Uh huh. Yeah. And me and my, my best friend, Mark Hoffman, we wanted to make our own Star Wars comics. Um, so I pestered my mother to get one of these black bound hardcover sketchbooks uh-huh and two weeks later she did and i started filling it up with comics and um and i and i did it all through adolescence and high school and i kind of set it aside during my college years because as i said i was preoccupied with um with philosophy um anyway i can show you real quick uh yeah please do because <laughs> the, the the beauty of having these hardbound sketchbooks is you know uh they're, they're oh, love it. so this is from about age 12 or 13 i don't know yeah that's all it's so cool that but, you still have that yeah yeah but you know it's kind of uh as you can see you know it was a there, i've got many of these and they're just absolutely full of comics it was a different mm -hmm. world it was a different era back then you know yes. kids have time on their hands they they weren't distracted by uh, TikTok and five bazillion TV channels, and they mm -hmm. um, and they didn't have anywhere near the same kinds of demands that are placed on kids these days in school. Um, true, true. Yeah. So yeah, I had uh, that's how I filled my spare hours in my summer. I I drew and drew comics. Um, yeah. So uh, but I so I studied you know philosophy in college and grad school. And I, I did have to, um, in, in terms of this, my path into the comics industry, in um, when I was, yeah, I was about 25 when I decided to make a serious go at it. And my drawing was good, but it wasn't quite at industry um, standard. So I did have to take, so for two years living in New York City, I, I worked as an office temp half time. And the rest of the time I, I drew in practice and I took a lot of classes at the art students league on 57th street in manhattan mm -hmm. uh, and it was it was all just figure drawing classes just you're just sitting there hour after hour drawing drawing models um posing and and i would copy drawings out of an artistic anatomy books by people like bridgman and and, and Bern hogarth and um after about you know and then i started producing sample pages and taking them taking them to conventions in new york city and washington dc Mm -hmm. um <clears throat> and um after about five or six you know, iterations of doing that i um i got my first job inking for a, a rinky dink publisher in long island called personality comics this is the early 90s uh-huh they did these um spoof books they would take the marvel and dc superheroes and do spoof versions of them kind of parodies so for about six months, I was inking for personality comics for, um, you know, next to nothing. And, and then and then I started and then I um, met the people at Milestone Media in 1993 mm -hmm. in McDuffie and Dennis Cow. And Milestone was a company that was partnered with DC 
um, <clears throat> they had separate offices, but they were they were producing um, four core titles: Static Hardware, Icon, and Blood Syndicate. And their angle was they were uh, multiracial, um, ethnic um, superheroes. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that was they were kind of doing that at a time when nobody else really was. Um, and um, I got a job as a colorist there. And then I, I um, finally got a job as doing inks there. Mm -hmm. And for about four years, I worked full time for Milestone um, under under the mentorship of Dennis Callen. Yeah. Very, very fine and great artist. Um, he and I did Batman, the Ultimate Evil together. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was the other title I was going to mention. Yeah. 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 Um, and Dennis was a great teacher and a, and a, and a, and a, and a good friend. And um, I learned an awful lot from him. Um, Milestone kind of in its first um, uh, version folded and closed down in 1997, at which point I started working just for DC. Mm -hmm. uh, Milestone is going to, uh, undergoing a resurgence right now. Um, Love it, yeah. And I'm Minnesota. so glad. Yeah, yeah, yeah me, me too. It's kind of been in the works for a great long time. Um, yeah. So that was that was kind of my route, my circuitous route, you know, into into comics. But I, I think like like a lot of the 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 short form is like a lot of uh, professional comics artists. I um started drawing as as a little kid, yeah. Uh, and, and I was twenty seven when I started getting my first real paid work, which is actually at least back then it was kind of late. I was kind of a mm -hmm. grand old man sort of because so <laughs> many so many people start some of them while they're still teenagers. Mm -hmm working professionally um yeah but um i didn't want to keep uh inking other people's work for i you know i i, I penciled about 10 issues of hardware and inked many others so i did do some penciling but i had become known as an inker and i didn't i didn't want to keep uh doing it for the rest of my career um um so that was another reason why I, I, I wanted to do things like the furnace, you know, more sort of, um, you know, kind of literary science fiction things, which is really kind of my passion. Um, yeah. yeah. And, um, and I, that really wasn't, didn't bode well for me, you know, just staying in the orbit of DC. Um, so yeah. <laughs> they, they should, they should circle back because those, I think there's a real space for the the kind of storytelling that the furnace is, um, and and I think people appreciate that. Um, so maybe I mean it, it's uh, a funny thing about the furnace. Um, in terms of when I was actually like writing the dialogue, um, and the pacing, I you know the I was actually thinking in terms of American plays, which oh, I yeah. yeah. Which I really love. In particular, um, I I had in mind Long Day's Journey into Night and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Oh wow, yeah. Those those were the two um, kind of wells that I kept going back to for inspiration about the you know how to structure the dialogue and also just in terms of how the characters related to each other. Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, you know, the, the two main characters are, um, you know, alcoholics struggling with that, mm -hmm, okay? mm -hmm. and 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 that that's a theme which, um, you know, is uh, right at the forefront of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and Long Day's Journey into Night mm -hmm. is uh, alcoholism and how it uh, wrecks lives, you know, and so yeah. I was I was kind of in that space when i was when i was in you know actually writing the script of the graphic novel yeah both of those um I, I can see that inspiration because i mean both of those are so great at showing tension when it's not even on the surface yet there's kind of that pot boiling beneath the surface kind of yeah. you know things are going to explode um yeah. and you have those explosive moments but throughout both of those plays there are sort of these understated moments where it's kind of teeming and building below the surface too. Yeah. Yeah. And also um, Edward Albee in particular, I mean, he, he was just um, like an alchemist in terms of dialogue in the sense that mm -hmm. he would write this dialogue, which scanned as kind of, you know, sloppy, casual, you know, um, 
just it's it's scanned as like really real dialogue like it was just a, a transcription of actual conversations but um each line is um is pregnant with so mm -hmm. much uh subtext and and meaning mm -hmm. and i and i was just like really really blown away i i, I kind of fell in love with that play in 2000 five after i saw the broadway i didn't know anything about it prior to that but i saw the broadway production with kathleen turner oh wow yeah and i was yeah. i was just floored um so i i read the play and that was right around the time that i was that i was writing the script for the furnace wow so. <laughs> yeah yeah love how those uh inspirations weave in yeah love yeah. that yeah <laughs> and, and the kinds of questions that you're exploring um with your books also uh, i was thinking about that background and philosophy of like how do things work in society and foucault and you know punishment and all of those kind of things so it's really it's really interesting to think about it and dig into yeah 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 um and the the philosophy that i that i studied i mean i'm i'm i i still when i'm able you know go go back and, and read that stuff um it's it's kind of hard for me to say how it's played into what I write um, when I'm writing like graphic novels or, but it has, I mean, cause it's, I, but it's, it's a little hard to specify. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I wish I could, I could point to something specific. Um, yeah. I, I, mean, um, I, I can say that, you know, I, I, my, my specialty in, in, in like in grad school, the thing that I really, kind of honed in on and focused on was the writing of, of Immanuel Kant. Yeah. yeah. His, meta, his metaphysics and epistemology. And, um, um, and it, you know, he's notoriously difficult. Um, but I, but I, I really, um, I, I, I dug him once I kind of um, figured out that he, that he was basically um, really preoccupied with this idea that um, what we perceive, you know, in the world out there, is sort of this uh, tapestry or, or uh, tissue of appearances. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of it's partly masking and partly revealing um, uh, a reality that we that we don't really have access to. Okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um, that that's kind of that that idea speaks to me a lot. I think it speaks to a lot of people. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but. I, I do think that in you know um, in in the various you know it's, it's a short list of things that I've written you know uh, the resonator the furnace and um, and 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 the short stories that I did for Monkey Soup Press in the early two thousands but I am I am always um, playing off of and concerned with the distinction you know between appearance and reality between the way mm -hmm. things seem and the way things are. Um, yeah. And 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 yeah. studying philosophy kind of you know sharpens your t tools for for thinking about distinctions like that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, and uh, I mean that that connects directly with artwork and trying to illustrate the world and, and capture ideas in the way that that you see them. Um, and I'll mention, I think it's is it over one hundred books that you've worked on for DC at this point? Is that right? Somewhere north of there um, or something like that i mean it's, it's I, I yes i'm that sounds about right i mean <clears throat> I, I i mean i know that yeah that's probably about right i've never i've never actually uh tabulated i i, I think that my my the, the total number of pages that i inked or penciled for dc was in the neighborhood of three thousand, which sounds like wow. a lot but compared to some people it certainly isn't um and I know I, I worked at one time or on, or another on just about every character in the, mm -hmm. in the sort of the major DC universe. You know, all the the heavy hitters. Like I did a lot of Green Lantern and Flash, um, and and one of the happiest collaborations that I had, aside from the the stuff I did with Dennis Cowan, was I I inked about five hundred pages of. Um, <clears throat> JLA material mm -hmm. with the Val Semix. Um, we did DC One Million together. That was the 1998 summer um, crossover event. Mm -hmm. um, 
that was kind of a DC universe wide thing, but, but Val and I did the six issues of the core um, DC 1 million story arc. Um, it was written by Grant Morrison. Um, and then Val and I went on to do JLA Incarnations, which was an eight issue series um, focusing on all, all the members of the um, JLA kind of separately. Yeah. Like that man had his own book and Superman and Wonder Woman, et cetera. And we also did JLA Foreign Bodies, which was kind of this wacky standalone graphic novel. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so an awful lot of JLA stuff, a lot of Green Lantern stuff with um, Ethan Van Skyver and um, Green Lantern Core with Pat Gleason. Um, I had the extreme pleasure of inking Tom Grummets mm -hmm. on, on, our, on a run of um, Power Company. Um, that was a great, great experience because Tom Grummet is, um, he's like Val Semix in the sense that they are both um, <clears throat> rock solid, you know, kind of just meat and potatoes comics artists who are all about story and authenticity and, and mm -hmm. creating drama they they neither of those guys were uh showboats you know um preoccupied with with showcasing a style or a look they yeah. were all about just telling the story and and really just solid solid artists um yeah. kind of like um you know um uh, john busima or um <clears throat> Joe Kubert or the younger mm -hmm. Kubert, you know. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and the other, an, another, I, I also, uh, one of, looking back, one of the things I'm most pleased about during my time with Milestone was that I had the privilege of inking an issue of Static penciled mm -hmm. by Gil Kane. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> really, really cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's what. That was daunting. And I was, yeah. um, I, because, you know, at that time, you know, as that was when, you know, Dennis Cowan was kind of my mentor and, and he was, he had me um, buying and reading stuff by Gil Kane, in particular, the Ring of the Nibelum. Um, and I remember him saying to me, you're just not going to find anybody better to study mm -hmm. uh, in terms of learning your anatomy. And then it was just like months later, uh, Dwayne McDuffie pulled me aside and said, "Hey, do you want to ink this issue of Static, penciled by Gil Kane?" And uh, <laughs> I was astonished. <laughs> so it was yeah. an education, but very, uh, but it was a little scary because Gil Kane at the time had this reputation for being um, a curmudgeon and very dismissive <laughs> and contemptuous of inkers, in particular. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I never found. I never actually found out. What he thought of my job. Looking at it now, I'm like, eh, you know, I could have done that better. But <laughs> <laughs> maybe the maybe the silence was good. Maybe that yeah. was, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I th I think the reason why Ultimate Evil l lives in my head so much is because I discovered it as a novel first. Um, and you know, as that kind of reader, like I would read prose and then I would find the comics and then I would see the films. And so it all lived in that like connected world. And then I discovered the, the graphic novel, the comics adaptation. Um, right. and it's pretty, it's a dark story, but yeah. uh, very well you know, done. It's, it's not a happy story, but, um, yeah, Andrew Vox, I think he passed away just about a year or two ago. Did um, yeah. I think so. I'm don't, don't quote me, but I think so. In fact, I'm pretty sure of it. Um, yeah, but he was, uh, I, 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 I'm not familiar with any of his writings aside from that. Um, but my, I remember going into the offices, um, Archie Goodwin was the um, editor. And, um, and, and we went out to lunch. Um, and I, and I said, um, what's it like? Uh, what's it like working with Andrew Vox? Mm -hmm. And he, and he said, so intense <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure apparently he was he was um his writing was just a direct outgrowth of his real persona i mean <laughs> mm -hmm. the eye patch and the 
I, I guess he was just kind of on in that mode all the time is how Archie Goodwin made it sound. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's a very finely written and, um, but, but yes, as you said, it's, it's, it's not a happy read. Um, Definitely on, one of the darker sides of the dark night. I think. Dealing with sexual exploitation of kids. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. So. Which was a lot of, of Andrew Vox's work and, um day job to um yeah. of prosecuting and, and things like that so definitely comes through <clears throat> yeah so so at this um point having done all of these works uh any current projects or go-to web spaces or anything like that 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 you'd like to I, share I, about I mean, this book um just came out from Fiden um about about two and a half months ago. And I just finished a string of, uh, it's how to draw sci-fi heroes and villains. Mm -hmm. It is the sequel to how to draw sci-fi utopias and dystopias, which was published by Fiden in 2016. Um, and these are, they're, they're art instruction manuals, but their, their peculiarity is they deal only with science fiction which which has basically been my um, chief ruling compelling passion since I was six years old and saw Westworld in its first run in the movie theater. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, so this one uh, deals is 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 mainly just focusing on brainstorming, designing, and concocting um, characters. Love it. But I I was just at. Um, Contropolis, New Jersey, Contropolis, Massachusetts, Florida Supercon, and MCM in London. Because my family and I live in London. This the, the book has got these two very nice foldouts showing um the characters within in action. Um the book is for you know basically ages 12 and up, but it's a very fine volume from Biden. So these are the two things I'm mainly, I mean, that's the main thing I'm sort of flogging right now uh, it's a very good book <laughs> and, and and my my website is prentice rollins art.com www.prentice uh, um with an s rollins art all one symbol dot com fantastic um, and i'll be sure to link it on the the podcast as well oh great i appreciate yeah. that yeah um, as as a would be growing artist, I'm going to have to get my hands on uh, the how to draw books. Uh, that would be a good thing. Your 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 kids um, that that you teach might might appreciate it very much. Yes, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, and, and they can watch me uh, sort of attempt and practice as well. So that that'll be good. That'll be good. All right. Um, well, did we miss anything as we're coming down to our last couple of minutes that you want to make sure to share? Um. No, no, that's uh, that's that's the central things right there. Um, we, we've talked about a hundred plus DC characters. We've talked philosophy. Uh, Emmanuel Kant made an appearance. I, I think it's been a it's a good comprehensive episode. So glad to yeah. share about your work. Thank you, Thank you Jason. I very I really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as did I. And glad to have you back anytime. Okay, I look forward to it. Thanks so much. Okay, bye bye.